Tingling Time presents a spine-tingling journey into the macabre. Prepare yourself for a trip downstairs to the scary basement. And now, here to guide you through the realm of the very, very spooky, your host, Mad Dr. Rosenbaum. <laughs> Good evening to you faithful listeners of the scary basement. It is I, the good mad Dr. Rosenbaum. Friends, before we get to tonight's show, I'd like just a few minutes of your time to talk to you about the Mormon Church. You see... Why are you doing that stupid voice? Well, I thought since we were doing a special Halloween podcast, it might be cool to do something a little different. Who's mad Dr. Rosenbaum? Oh, that's my character. He's the host. It's like the Crypt Keeper. What kind of doctor is he? What's his area of expertise? Oh, he's a podiatrist. He's a foot doctor. That's stupid. You're stupid! Killing Time presents The Scary Basement. We'll return after this message from one of our remaining sponsors. Johnston Brothers High Altitude Morphine Drops. Ask for them by name. Johnston Brothers High Altitude Morphine Drops. We now return to our program. <laughs> Welcome back to the show. I'm just headed down to the basement. Believe me, it's pretty scary. It's, uh, it's uh, not very well lit. And uh, these uh, so-called steps are quite delicate. Yeah, I don't think this was a good idea. Hey, keep it down. We got customers up here. Really? We got customers? Mm, no. Alex and I are just wanting to watch Mr. Ed. Hey, did you fall down the stairs? We need to put up a sign or something. OSHA could shut this place down in a minute, especially if they saw the men's room. There is no men's room. It's a kiddie pool filled with shredded newspaper. And there is a sign, you moron, right on the door. It says, do not enter. That's not a sign. It's a drawing of Eleanor Roosevelt playing Scrabble with four German shepherds done in the style of Rembrandt. It's not my fault you can't understand hobo code. Hey, is that a rib poking through your shirt? Well, what do you know? Look at that. Wow, that bone is really white. I think I've got internal bleeding. You want me to finish the introduction? Would you? There's this bright light I feel I must investigate. Oh, also, could you call 911? Well, I would, but I'm waiting for a call. It's kind of important. Hey, I think I see my old dog. Okay. Tonight's episode is an original teleplay written by Milton Lewis and Ellen Kaminsky, and it's a frightful little story called I Married a Vampire. Is that the title? Really? alone in my penthouse asleep. The polka band upstairs had wrapped up for the night and I was enjoying some much needed quiet. The doors leading up to the terrace outside was open, wafting the room with a gentle breeze. Suddenly I was awakened by a strange leathery noise that sounded like the flapping of wings. I opened my eyes. Moonlight filled the room. The night was clear and cloudless. With a possible chance of showers tomorrow afternoon, the winds moaned mournfully. goldfish. I sat up in bed, peering into the angry red glow of the moon. Suddenly the moon turned green, then yellow, then red again, then in a strange twist the moon turned into a green arrow. I then realized I was looking at a traffic light. I heard it again, the sound of wings. I told myself it was nothing, until out of the darkness that blanketed the room like a big dark blanket, I witnessed a pair of horrible blood red eyes hovering in front of me. Inhuman eyes, bleeding and bloodshot, no doubt capable of all kinds of cruelty. Suddenly, the creature attacked. I screamed as its razor-sharp teeth pierced my throat with a pain I'd never felt before, including the first time I'd ever had Indian food. Let me go, I screamed. Let me go. Charles, where are you, Charles? Go on, Patricia. Tell me the rest of your story. When I felt your strong arms around me and smelled the whiskey on your breath, I knew I was safe, Charles. But it was the most terrifying dream I'd ever had. Now, Patricia, we've talked about this. There's no such thing as monsters, you know that. What about the mummy I hit with the car last week? Patricia, that man was a burn victim. I'm telling you, there was a vampire in my room. A vampire? Patricia, look around you. It's 1947. You're in New York, not Transylvania. 
Why, the whole notion is just rubbish. Don't you think I've tried telling myself that? That it was the DTs? Or possibly the absinthe? Oh, Charles, I just won't leave this place. What are you, nuts? This is a penthouse. It's rent control. I don't like it here. There's something dark and sinister lurking in the shadows. And the water pressure is terrible. Listen to that wind, that mysterious and foreboding breeze. Those are just winds from the river. Honestly, you're being hysterical. Tell me. Is this your time of the monthly cycle? I admit, I deserve that. Do you hear it? That accursed, damnable flapping. It's coming from the terrace. That's just the awning, dear. So many noises. I can't bear being here alone at night. Oh, Charles, do you have to leave me alone here every night? Now, Patricia, you know I'm in the theater. The show can't go on without me. You're an usher. It gets very dark in the theater, Patricia. Who's going to show the people to their seats? It would be chaos. I'm sorry, dear. I would never ask you to leave show business. Oh, Charles, I'm so sorry to burn you with my silly fears and hopes and dreams and thoughts. Well, it's almost showtime, my dear. I have to go to the theater. I understand. That popcorn won't butter itself. Whoop! Nothing. Go, and do be careful. One more thing, Charles. The thing in my dream. It had your face! Good heavens! Johnston Brothers High Altitude Morphine Drops. Ask for them by name. Side effects include headaches, fatigue, big net pros, murderous rampages, vomiting, time travel, delusions, illusions, parallel dimensions, and shamanistic visions. Please contact your physician or local blood letter before attempting to take morphine drops. Make sure your affairs are in order and you have an alibi for the next 24 hours. Johnston Brothers High Altitude Morphine Drops. We now return to our program. It was sometime after midnight, three nights later. The rain beat on the terrace windows with the pitter-patter of drunken first graders. The polka band had taken a break, no doubt smoking their reefers, as musicians are wont to do. I was waiting for Charles to come home from the theater. The goldfish had escaped again, so I was rummaging through Charles's desk when I found something that made my blood run cold. A newspaper clipping from 1937, ten years earlier. A picture of a man, and the caption above read, Prominent welder and acquitted lunch meat molester, Charles Burroughs found dead of sudden heart attack. I looked at the picture again. Those eyes, that face, the unconvincing toupee. It was my Charles. I read further. There was a two-for-one on toilet paper at the Woolworths. Sadly, it expired. I'd read too far. Ah, there it is. The deceased would be laid to rest at William M. Gaines Cemetery after services at the Panucci Brothers Funeral Home. Bring casserole. Good evening, my dear. Charles. Patricia, you seem startled. I just didn't hear you come in. You didn't get into the absence again, did you? Don't be ridiculous, Charles. I finished the last of it yesterday for brunch. How do you feel tonight? I don't feel very well. Well, you look awful. You could have at least made an effort, my dear. Brush your hair, something. Oh, Charles, if I weren't so weak right now, I'd slap every living shit out of you. Do you know that? Did you sleep at all today? I told you, Charles, I'm not like you. I can't sleep during the day. <gasps> you sleep during the day? Of course I do, sweetheart. I work in the theater. As an usher. Right. I'm in the theater. And the concession stand, the ticket window, the men's room. It's still technically in the theater. Patricia, I think you may be losing your mind. Why are you pretending to be anything other than what you are, Charles? I know your big secret. I'm on to you. Fine. I admit it. I'm a cross-dresser. Are you happy? Not that, you imbecile. I found this clipping in your desk while I was looking for the goldfish. Oh, did he get out again? Read it! Oh, that's a good deal for toilet paper. It's expired. Next call him over. Oh, that! Ha 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 ha! What's so funny? It's a gag! Played on me by a co-worker. He made a mock newspaper with a fake obituary in it. I don't believe you, and I've seen you fondle the cold cuts before, mister. Patricia, listen to me. You can't go on like this. I'm worried about your sanity. Get away from me, you monster! Where are you going? Away from you, you monster! I'm going to prove to you that I'm not crazy! Open up! For the love of God, open up! What? What time is it? Do you have any idea what time it is? I'm so sorry to bother you, sir, but are you the caretaker? Well, if I'm not, somebody better tell me whose wife I've been sleeping with. <laughs> it's a little caretaker humor. I need to see the resting place of Charles Burroughs. Who are you? His wife. His wife? 
I come back tomorrow. He's not going anywhere. I see. Well, will this do? What is this? Five bucks? Look, lady, I know it's 1947 and all, but you can't expect me to risk my job for five bucks. Fine, here's a 20. Now you're talking. Can you break it? What? Break it? Can you give me back a 10? Or two fives? Or a five and five one? Whichever works for you. There's no way for some people. Fine. Take the path in the back of the house, make a left at the dead tree that looks like a man wailing in agony. It's right by the water slide. You can't miss it. Do you need a flashlight? You get one at the gift shop. I brought my own. Do you need me to come with you? Oh, would you? It'd be ever so helpful. Oh, I wasn't expecting you to say yes. What? Well, I, I thought you'd say no, Mr. Caretaker. I've, I've troubled you enough. That, that uh, won't be necessary. I'll be fine. More of an empty gesture, really. Good night, sir. I continued on the trail towards the tomb. After minutes, hours, time had no meaning in these strange woods. Finally, I came across the tomb. The inscription was clear in bright red letters, dripping with paint. Julio 187. No, wait, that was a bit of graffiti. There it is. Here lies Charles Burroughs, born October 3rd, 1890. Died May 5th, 1937. There was a lock on the door. It was old and rusted over. I picked up the rock. The lock shattered in two. As I set the rock down, I noticed the key to the gate hidden under it. I made a mental note to compensate the caretaker. I opened the door to the tomb. Darkness. Pitch black darkness like the soul of the devil himself. I clicked on the flashlight. The coffin lay in the center of the tomb on an altar. My heart beat wildly in my chest. Sweat poured down my forehead. and between my shoulder blades, found the length of my spine. With a trembling hand, I opened the coffin. I looked down on the white satin lining. The good stuff, not the cheap polyester blend they tried to stick you with. There was nothing inside. The coffin was empty. Suddenly, in the dark corners of the tomb, I saw a face. It was Charles. I dropped the flashlight and ran. Ran into the wall. I ran again. Ran into another wall. This went on for some time. Finally, I made my way out of the tomb and managed to hail a cow. Now, Patricia, just sit there and rest quietly. You're okay now. I'd gone to the one person I knew could help me, my older sister, Mildred. She'd know what to do. Charles is very worried about you, dear. He's been calling you from the theater. What in the world is going on with you? You would be absent. No, I finished the last of it earlier this week. Oh, so no absence. Mildred, I think I may be going mad. I'm just saying a little absence and we'd be set. Charles is dead, Mildred. I've been married to a dead man for ten years. Now, Patricia, dear, that often happens in a long-term relationship. Maybe if you lost some weight, brushed your hair, made an effort for God's sake. I admit I may have crossed the line. Tell me, do you slap Charles like that? Yes, on occasion. I can't understand why you're having issues. Listen to me. I saw his tomb. The coffin was empty. Patricia, what annoyed? I know what you're thinking. I'm not crazy. I'm married to a vampire. Look at the evidence. He sleeps during the day. Why won't anyone believe me? Well, that is some airtight evidence. I've got to destroy him. You mean financially? Uh, I mean, I've got to drive a wooden stake through his cold black heart. Well, it's the only way out. Well, you could just divorce him. I can't divorce him. Oh, is Charles Catholic? He's a vampire, you ninny. Haven't you been listening to the word I've said? You'll help me, won't you? Sure, haven't I always helped out my younger sister? Who helped you dispose of that hobo's corpse after you strangled him three years ago? I never strangled a hobo. Good girl, stick to the story. Where are you going? I'm going to make you something to eat. You look weak. Don't leave me here. What if he goes home? Where'd you get the gun? Charles' desk. You're being irrational, dear. Give me the gun. Don't move. You asked for it. What had I done? I'd just shot and killed my own sister, and it wasn't as satisfying as I thought it would be when I was 12. I ran from her apartment back to the penthouse. The place was empty. I was exhausted, mentally and physically. I wanted nothing more than to go to sleep, but I knew if I did, I would wake up as someone else, something else. I looked at the clock. It was nearly dawn. Charles would be home soon. I ran to the door and locked it. I ran to the telephone. 
Operator, give me the police and hurry. One moment while I connect your call. Hurry, it's a matter of life and death. All right, old ring. What do you think I'm doing here? Sitting on my thumbs? Jesus. Sergeant O'Royally speaking, 23rd Precinct. What can I do you for? No, Sergeant, you've got to send some men. It's my husband. He's going to do something awful to me. Oh, I see. A newlywed. Listen to me now. My advice to you would be to loosen up. Have a few drinks. Not that, you big Irish hoe. He's going to kill me. Sure, and I can't understand why. What with you seeming so pleasant like? You think I'm mad, don't you? I can tell by your condescending toe. Oh, now don't take it personal like. I'm condescending to all women. Well, what's the use? No one believes me. What's that? It's key and the lock turning. No, I can't open it. It's bolted from the inside. He's trying to get in. Not without bolt, he won't. Now he's being polite. Well, it won't work. He was still out there, but there was no way in. The only way in was through the terrace. If we were 15 stories up, he'd have to fly to get up here. <laughs> oh, right, the whole map thing. Suddenly, the terrace doors burst open. The wind blew through the house. There it was, framed perfectly in the double doors. Charles! Why didn't you let me in? Get away from me, you blood-sucking freak! Give me the gun! Never! I'm warning you. Patricia, give me the gun! How about I keep the gun and give you some bullets instead? You see? Your beauty weapons are useless against me! What are you going to do? First, I'm going to get my blazer mended. Look at that. It's full of holes. Look at it. This is going to come out of my paycheck, you know. No, Charles, stay away from me. What are you doing? Let me go. His teeth were at my throat. I beat at his chest with the butt of the empty gun. Then, as everything started going black, I saw six flashes of lightning. Go on, Mrs. Burroughs. Then what happened? What do you mean, that's it? I just told you everything leading up to this conversation. Right, right. Your men broke the door down and shot Charles. Oh no, that wasn't us. That was the caretaker. The caretaker? From the cemetery? He saved my life? Inadvertently, yes. Apparently he came here looking for some payback for a lock that you smashed. He thought he was shooting at you. Lucky for you, he's such a bad shot. What? How? I shot Charles myself. Nothing happened. He probably put blanks in your gun. Blanks? Why? I believe the whole thing was one big, unnecessarily convoluted plan to murder you. He wanted to drive you insane, so he tried to delude you into believing he was a vampire. Then, knowing you would try to attack him, he could kill you in self-defense. Well, that's really stupid. Very much so. But let's be honest, your husband was a theater usher, not a criminal mastermind. I suppose he was an idiot. He thought the brothers Karamazov were movers. But what about the holes in his blazer? Ah, oh, he probably pre-poked holes in his jacket and correctly assumed you wouldn't notice. Would you like to take a look at his body? It may help you believe the truth. His body's in the next room. Just go ahead and lift the blanket. Just brush the crumbs off. I was eating a bagel earlier. <gasps> what is it? Did you find a pickle? One of the other officers was eating a turkey sandwich earlier and... He just looks so lifelike. His lips are so red. It's as though he could move at any moment. Nonsense. Go ahead. Give him a good kick. Really? Are you sure? Isn't that disturbing evidence? Meh. Probably. I guess you're right. See? No such things as vampires. Now, werewolves, on the other hand. Can I kick him once more, just to be sure? Sure. Tell you what, if it makes you feel better, I'll join you. I'd better get the boys in on the action. Hey, fellas! Who wants to kick a corpse? Yeah! Yeah! yeah. 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 Kick him! Yeah. Kick him! Yeah. Kick him! Alright, Mrs. Burroughs, let's get you out of here. Wait, if my gun was filled with blanks, does that mean I didn't shoot my sister? That's right. Oh, thank heavens. Still dead, though. Heart attack. Scared to death. I'm afraid you're under arrest. Oh, my ribs. So you see, he really was a vampire. Wow, that sucked. Yeah, that was pretty lame. Also, why are you still talking like that? Thanks to Johnston Brothers High Altitude Morphine Drops, I'm as high as a kite. Johnston Brothers High Altitude Morphine Drops.